We're in 1 Peter chapter 2. Amen. So if you could, you could turn there. Uh, last week, we kind of closed out, and we're actually going back to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 again. They were right at the ending part, because uh, we went through the end of chapter 1 and to the beginning part of chapter 2. And last week, I'm not going to so much ask a bunch of questions, but we closed out um, with the most dangerous sin, most deadly sin. If y'all remember what that was, amen. Um, we defined that as being gossiped. Didn't we? Amen. And, and we looked at different scriptures concerning that. And we're going through 1 Peter a little slower than we had some of the other books because there's so much that he begins to delve into. And we've got from here until Jesus comes. Amen. So we don't have to rush our way through it. We're going to take our time and feed and, um, and question and learn in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter um, 2, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 is where we close out at, where he said, Wherefore, because of all the things I taught you up to that point, there were some things we need to put aside or lay down. The thought being there, like you take off an outer shell of clothing, Got to put down the malice, the guile, the hypocrisy, the envyings, and all evil speaking. Let's read verses 2 and 3, and this is where we'll spend most of our time on tonight. Let's read. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Amen. I want to talk tonight from those two, how to grow, as, how to grow up as a Christian. How to grow up as a Christian and how to measure your maturity. Amen. Am I a meat or a milk believer? And if so, how can I tell the difference? And if not, how can I go from the babe stage to, to uh, an adult, a mature believer? Now, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 5, 11 to 13 as well, because the Apostle Paul has some things to say about that too. Amen. But when you were saved, you were literally a babe in the Lord, right? Amen. So as a Christian, amen, we call it a new birth. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Everything at that point is new. Just, and um, the analogy here is often in Scripture comparing our birth, our growth to that of a child. And so... Baby is new. Everything's new with the baby. Life is new to them outside the womb. They were living for nine months, weren't they? Yeah. Amen. But now it's a new experience, and they've got to go through a process of growth and development. In order for that to happen, they got to be fed the right food. Amen. A new creation. We are in the, the new birth. Matter of fact, John three three. The term Jesus used was born again. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. 1 Peter 1, verse 23, that we looked at the week before. Amen. Uh, um, if you flip back just a moment, amen. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We hooked up some of those things with our security and salvation because the seed by which we are birthed is an incorruptible seed. Therefore, now we are we sit at that place in John where it says that if his seed is in us, we can't sin. Sin does not come through our newborn spirit. It's through our flesh, our old and abnormal nature, this unredeemed body. And this is why we need to submit the body and renew the man so we can become more adept at not falling into sin. Amen. And matter of fact, in Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus said that analogy again about being like a baby, except you be converted. That's the new birth, isn't it? And become as little children. The word children there is padlion in the Greek. It means infant. Except we be converted and become as infants, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Even then he alludes to that new birth process. Now, when you and I really got saved, we really got saved. And one of the things that can hinder our growth and development is how we understand the new birth. 
a lot of people still get stuck looking at what they were prior to. The Apostle Paul was so convinced that he was a new creation in Christ. Prior to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, verse 16, he said, Henceforth know we now no man after the flesh. Everything about you and I is new. If we really believe that about people when they get saved, then it would really be far from us to hold their past against them. And see, sometimes people still look back and say, well, not them. I, I know what they did. Well, you don't know what Jesus did. When I got saved, I might look the same to you. Amen. Some of my mannerisms might still seem to be the same. Matter of fact, sometimes some of our old patterns and habits, um, they begin to fall off of us, but at the moment of new birth, not always necessarily. So we can't look at people after the flesh when they get saved. Amen. We need to believe them. Take them at their word. If they are not truly saved, it'll show over time. Because he said we are known by their fruits. Amen. Now, there are certain tests that we can uh, go through with an individual because there is such a thing as false conversion. There is such a thing as wheat and tares. And this is part of why we need to have an understanding of what happened to you and I when we got saved so that we can truly lead people to a new walk, a new uh, relationship with Jesus. Amen? And so the word padleon there means an infant. Amen. Now, what is one of the unique characteristics of a new baby? If he said as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, what is a, uh, some characteristics of a baby? Amen. A baby is hungry. A healthy baby ought to be hungry. Amen. Matter of fact, you know, a healthy baby, if you, any other traits about a baby when they're born? Okay, a, he, a baby is hungry. Now, what do they do when they're born as a result of being hungry? Yeah, they cry. And um, what else do they do? They have an expectation to eat. We call it the feeding instinct, don't we? Amen. They have a natural, um, you don't have to teach babies how to suck. You know, they're born. They're ready. <laughs> you, 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 know, you know, you don't have to teach that. That's, that's instinctive behavior, isn't it? Well, what about you and I? If we're compared to newborn babes in the Lord, then a new believer ought to have some hunger about them. Amen? And um, I remember when I first got saved, yeah, I was hungry. I just wasn't able to discern what I ought and ought not to eat. Amen? So a baby then is dependent on somebody else for their nutrition. Baby's hungry. Yeah, the cry is for food. Matter of fact, it's consumed with a desire to just feed. We're compared to babies when we're born again. And so we ought to have a hunger, a desire for the things of God. Now, some babies aren't born healthy, but that issue of even unhealthy baby, you know, they might have some ailments and some challenges, but they still, hung, they still have a hunger, don't they? And so they need to eat. That feeding instinct ought to be there. Amen. And, um, you know, to feed themselves. They're consumed with it. When they wake up at night, they're not thinking about the parent. <laughs> they're thinking about themselves. So a baby then has... Uh, a certain amount of selfishness about them. It's not intended. It's based on that survival instinct. We need to eat. Saints, we need to eat. We need to feed ourselves. He said, uh, as newborn babes or, or infants, desire, crave, is literally what it means, the sincere milk of the word of God. So we need to have that part. We need to have that. And in the process, we'll look at how do you, recultivate the hunger because you can get fed the wrong food and cripple your growth. That's why it's so important that when someone gets saved, they eat right. 
that we get them rooted and grounded in the things of God, that whatever questions they have, or we already have a predetermined means to answer the questions that they should have. Amen? So what they want milk. The general food is milk, isn't it? For a newborn. So let's look at this analogy then, because they have a feeding instinct. They crave milk. They don't know it's milk when they drink. Mom does. Amen? In the healthiest way, and there are certain things that are in the milk that the baby needs. You know, I know we have substitutes, but still no substitute for milk, the breast milk. Amen. You know, um, you know there are uh, elements in the breast milk that can um, take care of allergies. And, you know, certain nutrients, even though we get benefits to the baby through formula and other things, there's nothing quite comparable to breast milk. God made it that way. He formulated it, didn't he? Now, the sincere milk of the word, then, if there's no other, um, yeah, there might be some things that add benefit, but there's nothing that'll grow a baby like milk. If that milk is the word, a byproduct of feeding on the sins. Now, he didn't just say any milk. He said the sincere milk of the word of God. So there's somewhat of a play on words there. So we need to get the right milk to the baby so the baby can grow up correctly. Amen? If the baby needs to be fed right. So let's look at some of these words here. Because when the baby begins to eat, now their life literally revolves around their next feeding, doesn't it? Now they need love and nurture and all those kind of things too. But they must feed to live. Amen. And if they don't eat right, they can be stunted in their growth. Satan hates the word. Amen. Because the word is what grows you and I. He said we grow by the sincere milk of the word of God. So most of the attacks that come our way, uh, whether externally, out in our culture, uh, sometimes even in, um, in churches, unfortunately, in seminaries, is to undermine the integrity of this word so that you, you'll grow, but we won't be healthy, well-rounded, um, thoroughly furnished believers. The main reason for tribulation, persecution, lust of other things entering in, distractions, is to get you and I off the word of God. So there must be some nutrients here in the word of God that can grow you and I up so we'll really be a threat to the enemy in his kingdom. So he wants to feed you bad word, unwholesome, unsincere milk, or to get you distracted and off the word of God so that you won't be able to live a life that really brings glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So what we want to do is to make sure that we feed on this that is called the sincere milk of the word of God. Amen? Now the word sincere here is the word adalas. Say idolize. It means undeceitful. So if the Bible says there can be an undeceitful or a pure word, there can be an impure. See, if we mix other things in, then it's not pure. Amen. Idolize. Undeceitful. Pure word. Psalms 119, 140 says, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. See, we need to concentrate on the word of God when we get saved. Amen. Thy word is very pure. I love the way the Bible says that. Now, also, the second meaning for this word sincere is unadulterated. Something that is adulterated is what? Watered down. Has some other elements mixed into it. It's not as pure as it should be. Um, you know, like milk is whole milk. You see, whole, regular milk is whole milk, right? But then you got skim. And then you got, what's that, 2%? Huh? Yeah, but that's from the plant. But we're talking about milk, milk. 2% milk, that means what happened to the other 98%? <laughs> yeah, it's gone. You know? you know, in other words, the full benefit for the average individual, it's been watered down. So we need a pure, unfiltered, unadulterated word of God. Matter of fact, uh, uh, adulterated is, that's the root word for adultery. 
Now, if we are talking marriage, this is what adultery is. It's to bring in a mix into the marri marriage to water down that covenant relationship. Hmm. Amen? Amen? So anything that waters down, that reduces the, the potency of what we receive. You know, I don't like, you know, if I'm going to drink a cup of coffee, I want coffee. And he put, I've seen people put water in coffee, and I'm going, ugh. They say it's too strong. Oh, that's the whole point. <laughs> no, I like man mellow, but, you know, I don't like things. How many of y'all like stuff watered down? Mm-mm. You know, unadulterated word. So that means then that we need to feed new babies a pure word, um, um, which means we need to give sound doctrine. That's the purpose of teaching sound doctrine, not to water the word down. Amen? And here's one of my warnings, and I'm, I'm not the only one that feel this way, but I'll voice it. Um, the unadulterated, unwatered down word of God means that we study the word of God. Thank God for all the study helps that we have. Amen. You know, one of the confusions, this is why I'm saying this, is that one, <laughs> it seems like I, 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 I get, I guess this part of my ministry is to warn. Now, have you ever seen, trans, not trans, you now translations that are good, but have you ever heard someone read from a text, and you didn't know what they were reading. That's not good. Paraphrases can easily water down what the Bible is saying. Now, and we need to be wary. You can use as alongside the Word of God because a paraphrase is not a true translation. A paraphrase is like, okay, the scripture says this, this is how, um, this is what I feel like it's really saying. And in our current day, a lot of paraphrases are called translations. The Passion Bible, how many of y'all heard of that? That's not a translation, it's a paraphrase. They call it one. The Living Bible actually was one of the few when it came out, and it's still a good paraphrase, it didn't present itself as a translation. The message Bible is a paraphrase. It's not a translation. Because the author is putting their thoughts in it. And so you have to be careful. I was at a funeral a little while ago, and someone was reading the Lord's Prayer, and I was going, they said at the end, Psalm 23, but in the reading, I didn't know what it was. You know, and have you ever been now, if all of us have a different um, rendering, you know, let's say we use the King James here, you know, and some may use the New King James, RSV, ASV, those are great translations too. And, um, but what if we all have like four or five different, and we're reading from one, and you, do you see how even in what's well intended, the enemy can cause confusion? It's not that hard to do. But some of those we have to really be aware of. Um, a lot of preachers today read from the message. And the person who did the message translation was pro-homosexual. And it filters through when you get the key text that reference sodomy. See, that's their opinion. Amen. Uh, the word is not going to make an apologetic for condoning unbiblical behavior. Your NIV, NIV is a little weak in those. It's a translation. But today's NIV is not the same as when the NIV was first introduced. See, the enemy can even find ways to try and water down the scriptures to bring confusion. 
So even when it comes to you picking out a, a Bible, amen, you need to make sure you stick with a, um, a proven translation. Um, it is, as a person with me, I, I don't trust a lot of new translations because you have to trans, change something in it to get it copyrighted. Mm. That's just an aside, amen, but we need to be careful because the enemy wants to, and it undermines the word in people's minds because if in the world they're saying, man, y'all got all, all these different variations on the same word, it can even affect our ability to reach out to them. So we have to stick with the word, amen. And if I use a paraphrase or some other along for my study, understand that's a companion help. Amen? Wasn't planning on getting into any of that, but we need to not allow what somebody else is, even when it comes to commentaries. I, I like commentaries, but commentaries aren't inspired. The word is. Amen? Um, you know, I've got a study Bible right here. It's a, it's a life in the spirit study Bible. Good study Bible. Um, but I've had others that are really good study Bibles as well. But in their teaching sections, they are trying to talk you out of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Or that healing is not for today. That's the author's opinion. But if you're a new believer and you're reading one, and you say, all right, they're teaching that 1 Corinthians chapter 12, amen, that all the gifts cease when we got the full revelation of the Bible, and I've got a couple that are study Bibles that say that, then that new believer can be, all right, Baptism in the Holy Ghost is not for today. Amen. See, that's, but that's based on what the author said, not what. So the way to stay safe is to stick with Scripture. Amen. Amen. And that means that you and I as Christians, our challenge is Acts 17, 11, to be Bereans, to search the word daily to make sure even what I say is so. That means, and you find what the Bible says and you agree with Scripture. Amen? So you get a good translation, you stick with it, amen, and then you use other sources for companion helps. But always stay with the sincere, unadulterated word of God. Amen? Amen. And they're good translations. I, I use the Amplified, you know, a lot. I, I use the King James, New King James, ESV, amen, um, Revised Standard. There are a lot of good translations. And, um, and what the mistake is a lot of people make is they try and make the word more readable. But unfortunately, it's not by reading that illumination and inspiration comes, it's by revelation of the Spirit. See, that's where people miss it. Amen. So I can read it and it can read just like today's newspaper. But that doesn't give me understanding. That comes through the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit for us, new believers and older believers, He's our teacher. He's the one that reveals the word to you and I. Amen? And, and so the helps are good, but it's by revelation of the Spirit of God that you and I grow. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So our growth then is a byproduct of proper eating. No second part of this um, verse here. It says that you may grow thereby. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And continuing on with looking at these different words, amen. Um, now, milk is a nourishing agent here, isn't it? and it's the word of God, amen. But the word, word, say word. word. See, we're mostly familiar with the word of God in two forms, mostly. Um, logos and rhema, aren't we? And, you know, the rhema word is when you speak it. Amen. And logos is the written word, isn't it? And so you see in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, that's the logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, we have the word of God, the logos, in written form. Amen. When we speak the word of God, the term, when the Bible talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, it's not logos there. We should already have read what's written and have that in our hearts. It's the word of rhema. Say rhema. See, that's how you resist and cast off devils with the word of God, the spoken word of God. 
You need to speak the word. So there's a place for reading the written word of God. We all should if we're going to grow. And then you and I need to speak the word of God. Get our mouths in line with the word of God. But the word, word here, amen, is the word that we get. Uh, it's the root word for logic is logikos or logikos. And it means rational or reasonable. Amen. So when the Bible says here that you and I grow by the word of God, it's the reason, rational word of God. The word of God is reasonable. You know, it's not just blind faith. The word of God makes sense. That's basically what he's saying. The word of God is sensible. Amen. And so this word then means that it is designed to get our thinking right. To get our reasoning right. So as a newborn babe, when you got saved, doesn't mean you thought right as a new Christian. We still came with our old thought patterns and habits from pre-salvation. Amen. Amen. A lot of our wrong concepts about God and life and uh, right and wrong and morality. Amen. When we got saved, we need, need to get our reasoning in line with Scripture, don't we? See, that's the word log, logikos there, log, log, logikos, amen. I need to hear a theologian say it so I can make sure I'm saying it right. But it gets our rational thinking correct. That's man renewal, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Amen. Where we renew our man with the word of God so that we can logically think according to this word. That's one of the marks of a maturing Christian, that we don't think like we used to, we've transformed our thinking, renewed our man with the word of God. So now we no longer interpret life through just our natural senses or our traditions or what we were told. We filter it by the word of God. In other words, you and I, when we go to this point, our worldview begins to get in line with how God intended it to be. We begin to realize that it is a reasonable thing for us to avoid sin. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Amen. Well, you know, you know, sometimes Christians still make allowances. Well, you got to understand, I'm just human. Well, yeah, I am, but he, he, he gave me the tools to overcome. Doesn't mean you won't struggle, but you got to apply the word and work that word so you can overcome. Amen? And even if I'm struggling, it still means God is right. <laughs> Amen? See, that's the logical way that we ought to think. We don't understand why things work the way that they do in this world, but if God says it's like this, he's right, and my understanding can get in line with what he said later. See, it needs to be key for us to grow as Christians. We need to realize that his word is right. You know, even if I don't understand it when I first read it, I've got to trust it that God knows best because he's logical. He knows all. Amen. And I'm learning to think after God. Amen. And it takes the word of God to teach me how to think. See, that's a problem a lot of people have in the world right now. Professing believers, where we make allowances for a lot of things that the world does, and we try and say, well, you know, no, God didn't change. <laughs> you know, and people try and make allowances for those things. No, we need to agree with God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And then he can catch our understanding up later. So the word is that renewal agent. You know, another thing babies need to learn? All babies, they act like the world revolve around them. Isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah. Three o'clock in the morning. Ah! I'm hungry. It don't necessarily have to be hungry. It just might want a little attention. Now, wait a minute. If, that's an, if we're compared to babies, then we shouldn't be surprised if a newborn Christian displays some selfish tendency. See, they've got to learn. Now, that requires patience with us who are a little more seasoned in the Lord, doesn't it? That means we don't throw them aside because their stomach made a mess. See, just catching how the Word uses this analogy as a baby should help us to be a whole lot more patient with new believers. 
and we're expecting to see a whole lot of new believers. Amen? Which means there'll be some work. Amen. Diaper changing. Amen. Oh, <laughs> that's work, isn't it? But it goes with the territory. Amen? Hallelujah. And the tutoring process to develop that baby is what discipleship is. Amen? We have to train up a child. Got to train a baby. Amen? And then I got to wondering today, why did Peter use that terminology? Because he did in, twice in these first two chapters. In chapter 1, verse 23, he said that we were born um, of the incorruptible word. And then he said here as newborn babes. And I got to thinking, why is he using that terminology so much? And then it dawned on me in John 21, verse 15, what did Jesus tell him to do? Feed my sheep. So Jesus knew that he would preach on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 would get saved. Well, all of a sudden you got 3,000 babies. What you going to do with them? They got to be burped, nursed, fed. That's where the deacons came in, wasn't it? They're helping that process. Amen. See, the church was in its infancy, too, in the beginning of Acts. But it, don't seem, it seems to me like Peter never let that get too far from his man that he needs to feed the sheep. Another thing that Jesus did that seems like he didn't let get too far away from his thinking, too, was when he and John were with Jesus at the Mount Transfiguration because he references that in this book as well. He actually says that we have a more sure word than even what they saw when Jesus was transferred in the mount. So Peter also emphasizes the integrity of this word. Let's find that real quick, because he talks about that. Man, Peter got this thing down, and it's in 2 Peter. And this is why we need to get people settled in on the word of God. Amen, because the word of God is the more sure thing that we have. If we're going to grow as newborn babes, then we got to grow up on truth. Jesus said his word is truth. Amen. So we got to feed babies the truth. In other words, you don't adulterate the milk when you give it. You got to give it as it is, and the Holy Spirit helps them to digest it. Notice verse 16 in chapter 2, 1 in 2 Timothy. He says, For we have not followed devised, cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Can you imagine for a moment, you have Peter, James, and John, and they're with Jesus. They were in this inner circle that Jesus took, and he went to the Mount, Mount Olives, and there, you know, he was transfigured. And he began to glow with the glory of God, so much so that the word said, brighter than any full or any cleaners could get him. And he saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. What did they say when they saw that sight? We need to build three tabernacles here, didn't they? You know, you know that was etched in his spirit, but note what he says here. He says, we, when we were made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, this they saw. Let's read the next verse together. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Man, you would think, what could top that? Amen. Let's read out aloud together. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. What's he saying? He said this word that you and I have is a more sure word than even what they saw in that Mount Transfiguration. When they saw Jesus transfigured, when they saw the Old Testament patriarchs there talking to Jesus, amen, and you have something more sure than that great sight right here. See, our trust can't be simply in the things we see. It needs to be in what God said. 
So if we're going to grow by this word, we need to realize the number one thing you and I need as our growth agent is this unwatered down, unadulterated, sincere, reasonable word of God so we can grow up strong as believers. Because there are a lot of enemies to this word. And the enemy wants to mesmerize us through our eye gate and through our ear gate. He said, look, I heard, I saw, but I've got a more sure word right here. Verse 20, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. That's why I keep always telling us, let's stick with what the Bible says. Amen. Well, in my opinion, I interpret the Bible this way. You should not have a private interpretation. What did God say? Because usually, oftentimes, when people run off into their private interpretation, it's really, I feel like God is saying this. What did he say? Because of what I feel and what he says don't jive, somebody's word got to go. See, this is where a lot of people get off base. If my thinking does not agree with what this word here is saying, then I've got to adjust my thinking. Not trying to explain away the scripture. I believe the number one key to grow is to make God's word the highest priority. If people gave God's word that priority, they wouldn't be struggling. I'm talking about Christians wouldn't be struggling over gender. We'd have no argument about family. I'm talking about from the God's people. If we just put the word number one, amen. There'd be no issue concerning the right and wrong um, in the church if we just agreed with God. And yet, oftentimes, believers, well, you know, now there is no no. What did God say? Amen. His word is truth. Our job is not to conform God to us. Our word is to conform. Our job is to conform to what God said. Amen. And so even if it seems like, well, man, you know, God sure, um, he sure made, there was a preacher a little while ago. He said, man, I wish God hadn't put all this in the Bible about genders. No, no, no you shouldn't be wrestling with that. You should, God said it, science verifies it. Hey, it's what it is. It's not unloving to speak truth. Matter of fact, the Bible says, Speaking the truth, I think it's Ephesians 4, 15. By speaking the truth in love, may grow up. So the only thing that's going to grow you up in him is the truth spoken through a heart of love. I love you enough. You love your babies? Okay. Now, if you love your baby, do you let them get away with anything? Hmm? Then why so many people lap poor babies? That's teaching them selfishness. Huh? Right. Mike. They think that if they hold the baby all the time, then the baby will know that they love them. And also they're trying to show other people that, well, I love my baby, I hold them. But then what they're doing, they're making that baby used to being held all the time. And so nobody else can put them down because you've made them used to being in your lap all the time. Right. So now what if we do new Christians that way? What are we going to produce? Babies. Babies. And when babies don't get their way, they go to squalling. That's why I said we can apply this analogy to the body of Christ because if we feed babies what they want all the time where they grow. <coughs> Amen. That means that if, if the ministry, a ministry waters down teaching because they feel like, you know, what they teach could be a challenge to the people and they might have to make some adjustments and let certain sins go and we accommodate it, we're stunning them. That's what birthed the seeker-sensitive movement. Hmm. It came from a good place thinking, but we won't really address any issues in church, and 
really address hard issues of truth because those that are seeking, we want them comfortable. The Holy Ghost is not going to let me stay comfortable if I'm living wrong. That's his whole ministry. John 16, 8, when he has come, he will convict, convict the world of sin. And he'll convict us of our sins as believers. And so that the word of God should never be watered down. Amen. We need to speak it in love, but there are certain things that we need to do with babies. Amen. Um, but it's a discipleship process. So I believe he used this terminology. Amen. Because he wanted to feed. What else do you think a baby needs to grow? Talking about natural babies. See, we already know these things. Amen. Baby needs watchful care, don't they? Yeah. They need to be fed. They need to be burped. And they need watchful care. And if they um, can't get that food right, they need to be burped. Well, you know, a baby, a newborn can't burp themselves, can they? Well, you need it for that. And, and it might feel like, man, I, I got to put them up here and pat them. I don't want to pat. If you don't pat them, they're going to keep that indigestion or whatever it is. You better pat them until they get that burp out. What about new Christians? They might kind of gasp and struggle at a few things, but they need us to come alongside. Hey, you can make it. You got this. I'm standing here beside you. Amen. Help them to get that thing out of them so they can grow. Same thing. You know, I sit there all, all during the day, and I'm thinking about this. You know, babies in the natural and babies in the spirit. And I begin to see some of these things. Saints, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned this thing exactly right. Amen. They need nurture too, don't they? Amen. Babies do need attention, don't they? Amen. They need nurture. They say if a baby is born and if you just let the baby lay there, if you never hug the baby, they'll die. How many have heard that before other than me? Amen. They need that nurturing, don't they? They need that touch. Amen. Well, new converts need that touch. Amen. They need to have meaningful attention given them. Amen. You're not to spoil them. But don't let them languish out there by themselves. Amen. They need our encouragement, don't we? Uh, don't they? Amen. What else do they need? They need our love, right? Babies need it. Amen. But they also need our correction. In the natural, if you never teach that baby, when I lay you down and it's dark, you need to go to sleep. What are they going to do? They'll they train us to be at their beck and call. Y'all heard pastors say this before. Babies are excellent psychologists. We think, man, there's a baby. They're a little blink. No, they done figured us out. <laughs> you know, if they want to see you at night, cry, come in there, and they smiling when you get there. Amen. <laughs> no. It happens, doesn't it? You know, and what we've got to do is to train them. So that at a certain time, you need to be in bed. And if you're in bed, I'm going to leave you where you are until you learn to fall asleep. And it's hard on you, isn't it? Might mean you have to hear them cry for a little while. You pee them make sure they're okay. Amen. But you still can't let them drive you. You're training them. Isn't this how a lot of parents become the friend and not the parent? Because true love will discipline. What does the Bible say? If you love them, you won't spare the rod. Spare the rod, the proverb, spoil the child. So if we simply accommodate and never bring the restraint of correction, then that Christian will grow up. Only consumed with what applies to them. And what we've done in the body of Christ is to try and adjust our message to accommodate babies, and we've kept a lot of people in a babyhood state. If we simply stick with the Word of God, you'll grow. Amen? So he said, the sincere milk of the Word of God. Amen. Because babies can't just survive on milk, can they? I think maybe the two things that babies eat really, really easy, 
you know, they like milk, and you don't, you don't generally have to get them to like sweet stuff, do you? But how long could they grow on either? You got to introduce some other nutrition to them, though. Now, do they always want that new nutrition when you first bring it before them? Are you trying to get them to eat them? Man, some of that parade baby food, my goodness. You know, <laughs> I'm going mad. Yeah, and you put it up there and it, do you stop? No. What are you doing when you keep doing that? You know they need something more than milk. Because you can't just go from milk to meat. So what do you have to do? Cultivate an appetite. How do you cultivate an appetite? All oh, y'all ladies, somebody help a pastor out. How do you cultivate an appetite in a baby? You got to introduce them to new food. And that means you got to coax them into eating it. And when you put it up to the mouth and they try and push it away, have you ever had to kind of like open it and stick it in? Huh? But sometimes you will put the sweet on the top of the food and put the, um, something else at the back. Got to be creative. Yeah, we got to be creative. Right. And then after they get past the sweet, then sometimes they find out it ain't so bad. That's they the thought yeah. that Proverbs 22, 6 carries. Yeah. When it says train up in a, a child in the way that they should go, carries the thought of introducing what they need with a little sweetness added to it. And then they began, through the experience, realize that this isn't so bad. You know, I, you know, when we first hear certain elements, you know, things that challenge us in the Word of God, some of them are a little hard to bite at. Matter of fact, Peter even said of the Apostle Paul, some of the things that he spoke was kind of hard. He said, but they were Scripture. He said some people wrestled with it to their destruction. You know, but they had to grasp at it in order to receive it. It's the same process. Some things are, every, if everything that we studied, if everything that we preached was simply the easiest stuff, then, then we wouldn't necessarily cultivate an appetite for the heavier, the weightier things of the Word of God. And so we want to grow from, you know, being that baby, that newborn, that, you know, a baby instinct is to feed, but as a newborn, they can't feed themselves. So we have to feed new babies in Christ's own. But the end game is to get them through experience to grow to a point to where they can begin to crawl and then walk and then run in the Lord, where, they can, where you can feed yourself the word of God. That's our end game. So that all of us as disciples know how to sustain ourselves by learning to feed ourselves on the word of God. And um, the Bible has a lot of tools here for us. And these are things we can use with the new converts that we're believing God for and we can use to grow ourselves even more in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? So we want more wholesome food. We want the heavier stuff. Amen. We want to work our way up to meat. Amen. And um, there are ways we can test ourselves to know where we are as a believer. Amen. Am I a baby or am I a, a more... I don't believe any of us here are babies, but uh, as a baby, you know... <laughs> Am I a baby, and how can I know it? That's the way I phrased it. You know, the Bible has tests there, so you can gauge where you are, not for condemnation, but so I can make the adjustments in my life to go on in growing and becoming a more well-rounded believer. Amen. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. I said earlier we'll go there. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. The Apostle Paul kind of laying this thing out for them, but he makes some statements here that are really important. He says here, how do you know if you're a babe in the Lord or not? For everyone that uses milk is unskillful. Amen. How do you know if you're a baby or not? For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. It's not an embarrassment to be there. We all start as babies, don't we? Amen. That's our beginning point. Amen. Now, if someone is unskillful, this term there means inexperienced, not knowing how to use the word of God. Amen. Unskillful in the word of righteousness is a babe. 
That's our starting point. That's all of us. We're unskilled. We have to be taught. We have to learn to use our weapons. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't use their weapons. See, when a baby is a baby, you pretty much do everything for them. But um, as you grow, you do less and they do more, supposedly. Amen? Ultimately, our job is to wean our babies off of us so they can be self-sustaining, isn't it? And what we seek to do at church is to wean not individuals to the pastor, but to wing you to Jesus. Amen? Now, notice here, he says, everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So, if someone is unskillful in the word, they don't know how to use it, you know, they, they may be a baby. Amen. I see a lot of people that serve God primarily for the benefit of their lives. That's evidence of a baby. Most of what we have labeled the word faith has kept people in the babyhood stage. My harvest, my season, my destiny, my breakthrough, my this, my, 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 my. That sounds like a baby, doesn't it? Amen. Generally, what's in it for them? The benefits, amen. And if you serve the Lord Jesus only for benefits. Thank God for the benefits. The Bible says he loaded us daily with benefits. Amen. But that's one side of the word. We also have a lot of challenges. And this is why a lot of people have gotten offended and have fallen away because they thought all they would get was the sweeties, the good stuff. And here comes all this opposition the you know, parable of the sore, affliction and a persecutions and all these things are rising for the word's sake and they got offended. The ones that grow and produce fruit are those that don't serve just for what they get. They serve him because of who he is. See, it's a huge difference there. And what we've got so much of in this country is believers who serve for what's in it for them. Amen. You know, what are the most of the messages that they listen to? Self-affirmation. You're this, you're that, you can do this. Well, Christianity truly is more than just doing, amen. You got a life to live. You're called to be a witness. And if somebody is just concerned with their comfort, what kind of evangelist, what kind of a witness? How are you going to endure persecution? How are you going to stand? Well, I didn't bargain for this. I thought we were going to just win the world to Jesus. And, and kingdom theology still teaches, a lot of famous preachers teach this, that we're going to make the world better and better until Jesus comes. Well, that sounds good. They call it the seven mountain man. They, yeah, no, no, no. Is that in the Bible? How many of y'all heard that type stuff before, though? Now they're finding out that don't work because the world is getting worse and worse. That's what the Bible said. So the true, uh, the, the growing be believer understands that in the last days, evil would wax worse and worse. But we can have joy because we know that when we see these things, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. See, our perspective gets right as we mature in the things of God. And we're not just looking for the benefit side. We're serving understanding that we're in a world that hates us, and we're seeing it more and more plain right now. <laughs> you know, I was listening to Tony Perkins a few minutes ago, and they were talking about this young man who lost his job simply because the company changed their rule on him working on Sunday. He said, well, I still want my Sunday. Out. Amen. But we're actually seeing physical persecution now in this country. Well, if somebody just got on board, Ray Comfort put it this way. If you come to Jesus just to serve him for an easier ride, and when we were watching Hell's Best Kept Secret, he was using an illustration about a guy that was in a plane, two people. One, both of them were given parachutes, and one said, I don't need this. I'm on the plane, smooth ride. And then they hit turbulence, and the one that had his parachute on, he just clutched a little tighter, knowing that if it goes down, 
All I got to do is eject. Well, if my thinking is that I'm serving Jesus just for an easier life, or as Joel Osteen says, my best life now, when adversity hits and I find out that don't work, what happens to that person? They generally fall away from the fellowship, don't they? And they begin to wonder, man, if God loved me, why is all this happening? Well, the same God that loved you said some of these things would happen. But you've been feeding on the wrong food. That's why it's so important that we eat right. Jesus promised us this. He, John 16, 33 said in the world, you're going to have tribulation. So if someone gets saved and they never expect to have adversity or anything to come up against them, no challenges, amen, it's not realistic. But it's feeding at the wrong table. If all you read is self-affirmation, if all you listen to is self-affirmation, then you're not thoroughly prepared for the challenges that come our way as believers, and a lot of those people get offended and they fall away. That's not God's desire. So what we want to do is to be well-rounded as believers. Um, in our covenant package is blessing, amen, but we're in a fallen world, so there's challenges. Amen? And because things don't necessarily work out well for us, it has nothing to do with God's love of us. A lot of people, you know, when tragedy strikes or someone dies unexpectedly, they get angry at God. Why did God allow this to happen? Now, as, how could you explain that to a, a, someone as a believer? Because they, they a natural tendency for a lot of people, even believers, is to blame God, isn't it? Well, how could you explain that to them as a Christian? Don't all of y'all speak up at the same time? <laughs> Amen. But see, that's an evidence that they weren't really fed um, as thoroughly as they should have been because when we get our worldview right as Christians since nobody answered, then we'll know that some things happen because you're in a fallen world. God's perfect will does not happen in this dispensation because we're still in this world subject to the sin. And when wars and things, how did God allow Ukraine to happen? God didn't do it. Wicked men did it because we're in a fallen world. See how your worldview makes a difference? James 4, 2 says, from whence come it wars and around other? They come from the lust of men. I want your nation. I want your ore. I want your body, your grain, your wheat, and your women. And they go to take it. Amen. God had nothing to do with that. And so once we get our thinking right according to the word of God, we don't get angry. It makes us draw closer to him, knowing the days you and I are in. And we're in the last of the last days. And so we're going to see a lot of things that um, kind of, man, I didn't expect to see this as believers. And they're escalating all around us almost daily. I mean, we're seeing things now that, you know, as a man, I know the Bible said it, but I didn't know I'd be seeing it, and I didn't know it would be so quick. Well, it's not a cause for us to panic because it's not working out the way I thought when I got saved. Now I know what the Bible says. Amen? And so now I can just draw a little closer to Jesus. Amen? And put my trust in him because I've grown up. Amen? i become a little more skillful in the word of God. I know when bad things happen to what they call good people, the Bible says none are good, not in yourself. Amen. It's not an issue. You know, life and chance happen to everybody. How often have you seen people get angry and mad because somebody got, how could God let them get in? God didn't. Usually it's bad choices. Now, or in spite of good choices, things go wrong. It's not an issue to get angry at God. See, our understanding from the word of God helps us to settle a lot of stuff, don't it? But we got to grow up in him so we'll think, as we said, like the word word said, logically. And that's the aim of growth for believers, to interpret the world through the lens of this word. Let me wrap this up real quick. Amen. Traits of babies, amen. Serving God primarily for benefit. Number two, affirmation, Amen which feeds selfishness. Um, when you put personal preference above the word of God, amen, uh, that's a trait, amen. How you were raised, traditions, amen. Um, 
when you're trying to align your, the word with your opinions rather than align your opinion with the word. <laughs> Those are evidences that we need to make some adjustments in our thinking, our logic, and um, means we're a little inexperienced with the word of God. Real quick, there's some ways you can grow. How do we grow, Pastor? Amen. Number one, you need to read the word to develop a familiarity with it. Amen. Do you know only like 4% of believers read the word more than what they hear it in church in a week? Talking about Christians. Less than that actually ever read through the, the Bible in their lifetime. See, a lot of things are happening around us now because of ignorance of the word. What does Hosea 4, 6 say? God's people will perish for lack of knowledge. And so we're paying consequences uh, for not applying the word of God to home, to family, to child rearing, to education. Amen. And because of that, we're reaping the whirlwind. Amen. First Timothy 4, 13 says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to doctrine, amen, to instruction. Amen. And so you and I as believers need to discipline ourselves as disciples to read the word of God. Pastor, I understand. I'm reading for general knowledge. Amen. But I'm planting it in my heart, even if I don't understand it at the moment I read it. Amen. I don't see plants grow when I plant them. Amen. But this is in the ground. And the Holy Spirit brings it back to my remembrance. I usually say you don't know what you ate last week, but you're still here, so it's working. Amen. You know, so you feed yourself. Even, man, I read, I, I, don't remember, I don't remember nothing I read. Well, your head don't, but your spirit, your spirit, your heart. Amen. It's still got in your heart. Amen. And so you, you, you read not so much for, because um, you can't remember everything you read, but the Holy Spirit can bring it back to your remembrance. Read the word. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.15 says that as we mature, we need to go beyond just reading. We need to become a student. We need to study. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman. Takes work to study the word of God. See, you can read, and it's hard just to read the word sometime, isn't it? Amen. Why is it hard to read the word? Amen. There's opposition. There you go. There's opposition to it, isn't it? Amen. And your flesh Mm -hmm. And the enemy itself right. is fighting you to keep you from being able to get that understanding so that you can put it in prayer. Satan's afraid of that, that you will get an understanding because the more you know, the more able you are to deal with him. Amen. 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 2 Corinthians 2.11 says we're not ignorant of his devices. Well, he wants to keep us misinformed about how he works. The word devices is his methods, is, is how he operates, amen. Well, the word teaches us that. If he can keep us from the word, we don't understand how he operates. You know, that he operates primarily through suggestion. You know, he can't make you do anything, but he makes an appeal to our lust, to our faults. And if we begin to think wrong, we're going to act wrong. So as we mature then through the word of God and study, amen. Well, what should I begin studying? Amen. Well, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, talking about new believers, if we're trying to bring someone along, well, we can tell them, you know, a good place to start reading is the Gospel of John. That's true. It is. One of my favorite ones to direct people to. But like I said a few weeks ago, I really believe one of the first things, and as we start doing new members and those kind of things again, I'm, I want to get people rounded, grounded in the love of God because too many people get saved and something happened if God loved me. Need to be rooted in understanding the new creation, who you are in Christ. Amen. You need to understand those things. Amen. But some of the first principles, notice here in Hebrews chapter 6, you're almost there. Amen. Um, before you go there, notice what Paul said in the 12th verse, Hebrews 5. He says, for when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. You have need that one again teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles or the utterances of God. So you can, allow, things can slip too if we don't keep moving on. We can fall back. But it kind of looks like all of us, as we mature, should be able to teach. Might not be called to a five-fold ministry gift, 
but we need to be able to train and develop others who come after us. For, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles. That word means utterances of God. And I become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Amen. Verse 14 says, but strong meat belong to them that are of full age or mature, even those who by reason of use, that's experience and exercise, um, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen. Well, none of us are all the way at that point yet where our senses are exercised to discern, but it's something to attain to. We're on the way there. Hey, but thank God you're no longer just on milk. Amen. We're chomping at heavier things. Amen. The weightier manners of the word of God. Amen. And so we study. Amen. We look at the first principles. Amen. And then he goes in, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Remember, there's no chapter division going from verse 14 to verse 1 in chapter 6. Do you know chapter divisions were, were put there in the 13th century? So they hadn't always been there. They're, they're there for our reference. But sometimes in the middle of a thought, you know, there'll be a chapter and we'll stop reading. And he's talking about our senses being exercised. Therefore, because of this, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or maturity, not laying again. So here are the principles he's talking about. The first thing that we need to get rooted and grounded in as believers, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Every believer needs to understand why they got saved. The foundation of repentance from dead works. You believe on Jesus, you call on him, but you, know, you turned from your former life and you received him and you got a new one. Amen? Well, you don't need to lay that foundation again. You've been saved. Now you build on that foundation. Amen? And the faith toward God. We need to get an understanding of faith and how faith works and how faith grows. How does faith grow? Romans 10, 17. And hearing by the word of God. So as we feed on the word of God, a byproduct is that we grow in faith. Our trust in God begins to grow. Amen. We need to understand the doctrine of baptisms. Amen. You know, a lot of people, even theologians, don't understand the doctrine of baptisms. Amen. You know, there are at least three, I tend to say four baptisms. Amen. Well, some that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit substitute that with what they call cessationism. It means that when we got the full revelation of the Word of God, those gifts were dead, done away with. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that we were given these things until, amen, we all come into the unity of faith. We're not there yet. So baptism number one, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, is into Christ. So if somebody says, well, well, you hadn't been baptized until you speak in tongues, well, that's a different baptism. Because if you hadn't been baptized into Christ, Christ is not going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Amen? So every believer has been baptized into Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew, Gentile, bond, or free. We all, all have been made to drink of that one spirit. That's receiving Jesus, that drink of the spirit, John 7, 27 and 28. That's the first. Without that baptism, you don't get anywhere. Getting water baptism won't save you. Amen. And yet some believe in baptismal regeneration. Amen. No, you're baptized into Christ as an obedience to him. And an outward testimony to those without, I get baptized in water that symbolizes my identification with Jesus, my death in him, my burial, and my raise, Paul said in Romans 6, to walk in the newness of life. Amen. That's the second baptism. Amen. And you shall receive power, Acts 1-8, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We need a baptism in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, but there's another baptism that we generally don't hear about. Luke 12, verse 50. It's trials. <laughs> they tend to call it baptism. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how I am straightened till it be accomplished. What was he talking about saying baptism there? The agony of the cross. Amen. 
the tribulation that you and I go through. Jesus said he was limited until that was done. That would be a whole nother teaching. We don't have time for that tonight. Luke 12, verse 50. So we could say, you know, some people say a baptism by trial is what that would be called, or a baptism by fire. We've heard those terms, haven't we? It means to go through. Um, amen. And um, we out of time, so. The last one I mentioned, and we may come back and teach on these a little more in depth. Joshua 1, 8, meditate the word. Read, study, get an understanding of what happened when we were saved. Amen and meditate in the word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but therein shalt thou meditate. The word meditate in the Hebrew means to mutter, to say. You need to speak the word of God. That's part of it. Part of it is thinking. Lord, what are you saying? How do I apply this to my life? It's going through the process of seeking application of the word of God. Amen. And, and then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So we need to learn to meditate on the Word of God, to read, to study, amen, for understanding and spiritual growth. And as we go through those areas, we begin to grow and mature, amen? And our goal is to grow up in Him, amen? amen. And you never grow unless we begin to do so, unless we do those consistently. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we know people that we can help along the way. Amen. They need to know that when they read, just because they didn't catch it instantly, didn't, don't stop. Keep, keep going. Read out of obedience. Amen. Amen. Paul said it from a child about Timothy. Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures that made him wise unto salvation. Well, if someone hadn't been speaking and reading the word over him, the seed wouldn't have been put in him. Amen. So we need to stick with it. Even when you feel like, Pastor, I'm wasting my time. I'm not getting understanding. I start reading the Bible and I just this sleep just come over me and, and I wake up with my head in the book like this. Amen. Don't give up. Amen. 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 Revelation is coming. Amen. Don't quit. Amen. The enemy is doing everything he can to keep you from this word. He fears it. Amen. And I want you to write down Matthew chapter 13. And Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower really helps us to see how, how much we need to press to get into the Word of God to allow it to grow and birth us. It talks about the types of hearts, which is the sower that the Word of God, the seed, is planted in. And the enemy is against it. Lust, distractions, persecutions, to try and get you away, to get you offended, angry at God. Anything to keep us away from this word. That's why David said he desired this word more than necessary bread. In closing, I'm going to read this one scripture. This is um, it's an Aramaic New Testament. And what it has is, you know, the actual Aram Aramaic of 1 Peter 2, 2. And it really makes it really plain. Amen. It simply says... It's got Aramaic on one side and along with it, the, the literal English, being barely birthed babes, panting for the word is milk. That denotes thirst, doesn't it? Pure and spiritual, wherein you grade into life if you taste that Yahweh is gracious, which is verse 3 that we didn't get to. But see, we tasted and saw, didn't we? Amen. God is good. Well, how do you know you're good? I tasted this all. I'm a partaker of eternal life. His spirit is in me. Amen. My eternity is settled. I know where I go. See, those assurances we need to get settled for new believers. Amen. Because the fear of death, Hebrews 2.15, man, I'm, I want to keep going, is what keeps most of us in fear and, and is why most of us won't share our faith. Fear for the body. So if we get these things rooted in us, we won't be afraid. Amen? Christians need to know that God is with them. How often have we heard people say, Lord, go with us and be with us? No, he said, I'll never leave you. See, we got to get our mouth right. 
in agreement with the word. Amen? I ain't got nobody to help me. Hebrews 13, verse 5, amen, and 6. For he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, therefore the Lord is my helper. See, we always have to, you're never by yourself. You're never without help. Amen? The Holy Ghost is with you. So I'm talking about thinking biblically. If the comforter is with you, what does comforter mean? It means the one with strength. But comforter in the Greek is the word parakletos. It means the one who's come alongside you to help you. I'm never without help. See, that's what I'm talking about. When we begin to reason with the scriptures, when we get experience with the word of God, and then we can ration our way through the scripture, and even when we feel the oppression, and we feel like in our flesh we want to get down, that word begins to rise up, and you begin to vocalize it, and you take courage, and you get up, and you keep going. That's where we're moving to. Because we're going to need more and more word in us to offset all the stuff coming from out there against you and I to the, that's to beat and press us down. God, we ask you to bless us tonight in Jesus' name. With understanding, God, and we thank you, Lord, you've given us the ability to retain. God, we thank you that your word does not return void, that it prospers in us in Jesus' name. So, God, we thank you that you are working in us both to will and to do your good pleasure. And so, Jesus, we take courage. We take strength. We receive it from your word in Jesus' name. And, God, in spite of what's happening in the world, God, our hope and our salvation is in you. And so we rest and we give you praise, God, for your grace that works in us and that mightily in Jesus' name.